So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is these four Hindu Buddhist kingdoms in Nusantara. So Nusantara covers the Malay Peninsula and, the, uh, and what we now call Indonesia. As an overall term, we use this term Nusantara. The four places we're going to be looking at are Bujang Valley, which is in Kedar, and then Srivijaya in Sumatra, and then the Sailendra uh, dynasty, which is where Borobudur is, and then Majapahit in eastern Java. The reason this area became uh, so important is because of the trade between India and China. Now there are different trade routes between India and China. The first trade route, which is very familiar for people, because this is the route that uh, Zonshan, for instance, took uh, from Ch Chang'an down into, you know, the Buddhist heartland around what we now call Patna, uh, that's not far from Bodh Gaya. It's actually a really uh, difficult route, although Zanshan set out with something like 30 people when he started that trip, or along the way he picked up about 30 people, most of them died on the way because of the difficulty, first of all, crossing the desert, this is the Tarin Basin here, and apart from the Sahara Desert, this is the biggest desert in the world, and it's a really difficult desert to cross. But once you've crossed the desert, you've got to get over the Pamir Mountains, which are some of the highest uh, passes in the world, 4,000 odd meters high. So a lot of the people who died on that trip actually uh, died trying to get over those mountains uh, because the weather is so bad, the air is so thin, and it's just almost impassable, you see. So one of the routes through, one of the main routes through for this very profitable trade between India and China was this overland route that went through the desert and then over extremely high mountains and was very dangerous. Of course it was very profitable as well and that's why people actually did it. And this is the way that Buddhism originally went into China. It spread along, you know, these areas, first of all up into Kashmir, and then into what we now call Central Asia, and then into, you know, Xinjiang, and into uh, China proper, and into Chang'an for that matter. Chang'an is the old name for Xi'an, yeah? Like this. So that was one way merchants uh, established the trade between China and India. There was a second route which came through Myanmar. For whatever reason, which I'm not really sure, this route seems to have been not used very much. But it, there, there was a route and it was there, uh, but it seems not to have been so popular, which I presume means that, you know, this must be even more difficult somehow than going you know, through a desert and over these really high mountains. It must have been like quite impassable or something like that for it not to have been used. Because for one thing, it's shorter. You, know, you would think they, they wouldn't want to go. There's no deserts. There are mountain ranges, of course. But this was the second route, but it doesn't seem to have been used so much. The third route, which is the route that concerns us, are the sea routes, the, the silk roads that went along the sea routes. So these were coming down from Patna, you could get to the coast quite easy, and also from southern India, you could get to the coast quite easy, and then you can either come down here, and then you can go through the uh, Straits of Malacca, and then around Singapore, and they would land somewhere near Shanghai and then cross inland to Chang'an, which is the main 
you know, it was the capital in those days. So it was the main center that people were trying to get to where they could sell. On the one hand, they can sell the goods that they brought from India. On the other hand, they can then buy the uh, silkwares and various other things that are being produced in China, you see, lacquerware and so on like this, and then can bring it back. Then, as now actually, you, you know even now, we get pirates in the Malacca Straits. You know, you, you occasionally see reports of oil tankers that have come around uh, Singapore and then they're coming up the Malacca Straits and they're actually boarded by pirates. Even now, this is still happening. But in those days, it was even more so. It was very, very dangerous to go through the Malacca Straits because they're very narrow on the one hand and then the pirates can come out and all the goods that you brought all the way from India or you brought all the way from China can be lost to the pirates, you know, and you might even lose your life as well. So there was another route that they uh, were using, which was to get the wares across land here, you see. This was another way to get through without having to go through the Malacca Straits, which was so difficult. Another way was to avoid it altogether by going west of Sumatra and then you come down west of Sumatra and you can go through this way you see and you can also avoid the Malacca Straits uh, but of course you can also get pirates here because it's still a, you know, a small kind of crossing that you've got to get through and if they know you're, you're coming and you've got you know, a ship full of riches and everything it's another way that they could uh, do it. So these are the kind of uh, routes that were being used. Every single one of these routes is very dangerous, but it was extremely profitable. So because of the, because of the profitability of these routes, whether by sea or whether by land, still the merchants would you know, risk it because you could get 10 times, 20 times, 50 times profit by taking wares that are very cheap in India and selling them in uh, China and then getting wares that are very cheap in China and selling them in India. Now why are these routes so important? Because this is also the way the Buddhism spread. Buddhism spread out as I said earlier, it went out into Kashmir, Central Asia, and then down into China. It first, after that, it went down into Vietnam, Viet, what we now call Vietnam. Vietnam had uh, Buddhism very early, about uh, first, second century. It also went up into Korea, about the third or fourth century, and eventually went into Japan, fifth and sixth century. But the only reason that the missionaries were able to take the religion out to these various kind of remote places was because of the trading routes. And that's why the silk routes, whether by sea or whether by uh, land, are very important for Buddhism because this is how Buddhism spread throughout Asia. It not only spread, you see, to China, but it also spread down into Malaysia, Thailand, Myanmar, Sumatra, Java, also into uh, uh, Borneo, and also into the Philippines. Uh, the bottom part of the Philippines, somewhere here, also had Buddhism, and we still find Buddhist relics there, like steles and things like this, from those days. Now, we take a closer look. This is the path through the Malacca Straits. And this is the Bujang Valley area. And now you can understand why the Bujang Valley became very important mercantile center. And they used to come to Bujang Valley. You know Mount Jirai? is very high and very prominent and it can be seen from a long way off on the sea so when the traders are coming down they know, when they see Mount Jirai 
they know if they land under Mount Jirai. In those days, the rivers from uh, this area would go up uh, quite a long way. Now they're all silted up, but the rivers would go inland and they would come uh, downland. In actual fact, there was only like 30 or 40 kilometers you had to take the goods over land. And once you've got them over land, you've got many possibilities. You can take them to Cambodia, you can take them to what is now Vietnam. There was a big center uh, at Phu Nan in Vietnam, and you can take them on to China as well. So to avoid the problems of going through the Malacca Straits, then they would drag the goods overland, first of all up the rivers, then when there's no more rivers to traverse, they would drag the goods over until they came to the other side of the rivers, which is um, where, more or less, where Lankasuka is. Actually, this is one of the most historic sites in Southeast Asia, and it's the earliest uh, historic site in Southeast Asia. And these are the Bujang Valley sites, these red spots. These are the Chandis, that means the historical monuments that are surviving from the ancient type. And there's over 170 sites around the Bujang Valley area. In fact, it came all the way down to BM. You can find monuments in BM. And then it's all the way up to SB and beyond. This is uh, one of the things that was found. This is unfolding this. This is the original, and this is a drawing. On the sides of this are these writings. And on this side, you see, is this writing. And on the top is this writing. It's called the Bodhigupta inscription from the 5th century. And it's in, interestingly enough, it's in Pallava script, which is a South Indian script. And most of the scripts came from India. So these are South Indian uh, scripts. Those are the main ones that you find. If you look at old Javanese, the old Javanese script, it's also uh, very much like uh, Pallava. One thing I have to say is that, um, you know, one of the reasons people don't know about uh, the Bujang Valley and the importance of the Bujang Valley is because I think the government doesn't want you to know about it. There, there are reports of uh, so many objects being found in the Bujang Valley and then they've been taken to KL and they're put in the Museum Negara but they're put in the basement, not on show, like this. Even the Muslim archaeologists complain about the situation, you know. Uh, there's actually hundreds or maybe even more than hundreds of objects that are being kind of hidden away Whereas in any other country, I think, apart from Malaysia, you know, it would be like, you know, something that they can show to people and everything. But in Malaysia, they seem to want to hide it. Anyway, this is one of the Buddha images. As you can see it's very fine, very classical in design. Uh, that was found at Chandi Pendut in uh, the Bujang Valley. One of the problems it's not like the uh, remains that we find in Sumatra or Java. In the, the, the remains in the Bujang Valley are not very spectacular or interesting. They tend to be like this, you know, and you kind of look at it and it's like a, you know, a block of bricks and you kind of uh, walk onto the next block of bricks, you know. So it's not like Angkor either, you see. Angkor has these... Uh, fantastic heads and all like this and these um, reliefs and so on that tell a story and everything but at Bujang we don't get it but it's still uh, a very important site because this is the earliest site in uh, Southeast Asia it actually dates back you know by radiocarbon dating it dates back to the first century AD 
like that, which is about three centuries earlier than the next kind of man-made buildings which occur in Funan in south, what is now South Vietnam. So we can see that as the merchants were coming out, they not only brought the goods that they had with them, you see, they also brought the culture and they brought uh, the polity as well and they brought the religion everything came with them and these things were adopted locally the Bujang Valley really it's it's not you know something very striking when you go and see but there are you know numerous chandis there and it's worth having a look and it's really a historical site in Southeast Asia they talk about wanting to promote it as an international site of course they're not going to get the visitors that they get at Angkor or at Borobudur because it simply isn't interesting enough but you, but it, but you should know uh, that it's there it's the earliest site in Southeast Asia it has significance and um, this is the earliest remains of these Buddhist Hindu kingdoms in Southeast Asia are actually found in Malaysia. The Bujang Valley was important because it was a, you know, a place where the trade came in and could be passed over to Lankasuka and it goes on its way. What does that bring? For one thing it brings great wealth. Yeah? When they're transporting the goods everybody takes their cut, obviously. They bring the goods in and they transport it and then they add their own, you know, thing. So, the, you know, the area became rich. It wasn't what we call a philocracy, which is a maritime empire. But the next one we want to look at, Sri Vijaya, it actually became an empire. It was based in what is now Palembang on the Sumatra coast below you know Singapore in this sort of area and this rose a number of centuries after the Bujang Valley uh, probably around the 5th or the 6th century uh, the Sri Vijaya Empire began and what it, what it was really is a maritime entrepot uh, where they were able to control the flow of trade and then they would tax on the trade. Once you're taking tax, as every government official knows, you can become rich. You can uh, use that money you know, to uh, make more vessels and control the area and everything like that. So then they had all the other places on this route became like vassal states. That means to be able to conduct trade they would have to pay Sri Vijaya and Sri Vijaya would give like protection so if you want it in simple terms it's like a protection racket yeah and they had a lot of ships and they controlled this area and then they ensured safe passage for the traders and from that safe passage the traders paid money to the uh, Sri Vijayan Empire. So this is uh, actually uh, quite recent, I think from the 1950s or something. The Sri Vijayan Empire was in Palembang. If you know what, what Palembang is, it's like a port uh, area in Sumatra. It's on two rivers that go into the uh, sea. Most of the housing was like this. Yeah. It, you know, there's only four here, you know, so it's not very many. There was more than four when it was the capital. But this gives you the idea. They made these houses in the river, and then, the, you know, the majority of people would be living in these houses on the river. And then when they want to transport or have commerce or whatever like that, then they would just get in their canoes and they just go backwards and forwards. It's very easy, of course, to travel on water. If you've seen Sumatra, you know, it's uh, like dense. Nowadays, it's like dense 
palm trees. But in those days, it was like dense and uh, original uh, forestry, you know, very difficult to trans trans uh, transverse. Uh, these days, of course, all the roads are in and all the communications are in and you can just go and you drive across and you know or you take the train or you take the bus or you fly or whatever but in those days it was not like that it was very uh, dense forestry as you can even see here and so most of the housing was actually on the river that has an important consequence because most of the housing was on the river you can see that this is infinitely destructible. It's going to fall down into nothing once it's abandoned. It's not going to take very long before it becomes nothing. Inland, you get this area, Jambi. Uh, Jambi was somewhat inland. Now, Palembang is down here, but these areas all around here uh, uh, where the Sri Vijayan Empire was. Now, uh, one time it was on the coast here, another time it moved inland to protect itself from raids coming from outside, you see. So, Jambi is a very important Buddhist centre. Uh, I went there last year because there's uh, you know, in Jambi, they have, it's more a Jambi, they have these uh, temple areas. Most of the remains are still underground, but some of them have been restored. And so they're quite um, amazing. And this area is about, which is where this temple uh, part is, right? This is about 80 square kilometers where these temples uh, are found and there's a, I think there's actually something like 80, 80 chandis in this area but most of them are underground but some of them are still overground um, the ones that you can see marked like chandi tingi and uh, chandi mora and uh, chandi kemba batu and so on these have been restored now you can see it's on the river you see so again, how important the coastline and the rivers played because this is how you can get communications. You can see even here, you know, I mean, a lot of that has been cleared. But you can see it's still kind of uh, a lot of forestry and everything like that. How far inland you can go is, you know, a, a question is a speculation in those days. So these are the, some of the monuments that are found in Morajambi. I don't know, because they don't have this relief work and there's not much stonework, it's mainly brickwork, you see. There's some stonework, but not very much. And again, it's like something like a bigger version, a better version, a more elaborate version of Bujang Valley. It's more interesting uh, there's many more monuments, but as I say, just like in Malaysia, you know, a lot of these places have not been uh, properly excavated. I think myself, from what I know of Indonesia, I've been going there now for about 10 years on regular trips. The Indonesians themselves are very proud of their history. They talk about their classical period. You know, whereas in Malaysia, they try to hide anything pre-Islamic. Indonesia, it's not like that at all. They're very proud of their history and they call it their classical period. And, you know, they take their kids and everything, you know, they bust their kids out to these historical sites and they show them uh, to their children and teach them about how important these sites are. So the same sort of thing happens at Morajambi. This is another of the buildings. There's many of them, but as I say, even more are underground. I think it's like this when they find them, you know, just bricks kind of piled up around trees. They're called manapas. So these manapas 
this is a very extensive Manapa pl- area where we visited, and you know from this they reconstruct them. You can see how old the trees are, a thousand or a thousand two hundred years old, something like that. Really a spectacular sight. But all around here you can see uh, the Manapas. Now Morajambi is a very important center. Why? Because you know Yi Jing, the Chinese pilgrim. You all know Zonchan, isn't it? Right? Who was the, uh, probably the most important p- uh, Chinese pilgrim who went to India in the, uh, I think the s- 7th century, 620 or something like that. And then he spent 20 years there. He collected so many texts. And then he took them back over that route I showed earlier. He took them back to China. And then he spent the rest of his life translating those texts into Chinese. Yeah. So Yi Jing was another pilgrim who uh, came to India later. Now Yi Jing, when he came, he didn't go the land route like Zonshan. He came the sea route. So the sea route goes via Sumatra. So he left a description of the, it's called something like the description of the Buddhist practices in the Malay Peninsula in the 7th century. It's got some sort of title uh, like that. It's a very important uh, historical record that we get from the Chinese pilgrim. It's, it's just one of those things that the Indians didn't leave many records, the Indonesians didn't leave many records, but the Chinese were very keen on recording everything that they found when they were uh, going through these sites. So Yi Jing actually spent six months in Sumatra at this monastery, and at that time there was about a thousand monks who were uh, studying in this monastery, and they're studying Sanskrit and Buddhism. Outside of India, the most important center for Buddhist studies in those days was actually Morajambi, and this huge site that you know I've just been showing you the remains of. And I don't know if you know much about uh, Tibetan Buddhism, but there's a very famous missionary to Tibet, Atisha. So Atisha, before he went to Tibet, he's a Bengali, what we now call like Bangladesh. Uh, Before he went to Tibet, he was studying in Nalanda, and from Nalanda, he came to Morajambi, and he studied with the Buddhist masters in Morajambi, and I forget the name, Sri uh, Sri Lopar, I think the name is. His direct master was Sri Lopar, and it's from uh, Sri Lopar that he got the teachings that are now the Lamrim teachings, that means the meditation teachings in the Tibetan tradition. They actually came from Sumatra, and from Atisha's master, who was a Sumatran, you see. Now again, you see, most people don't know this, they, they think Atisha, because he was born in India and he was a missionary in uh, Tibet, they don't know about the connection with Sumatra and with this site, you know, with Southeast Asia and this part of the world. But it's very important that the Lamrim teachings actually came from the meditation teachings uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, actually came from Sumatra. That's the root of those teachings. And so Sumatra is now a really important pilgrimage site for Tibetan Buddhism. You might be surprised that Morajambi receives about 80,000 Tibetans as pilgrims every year. And they come in masses uh, during uh, Vesak, you know, because this is where their root teacher came from. So you get you know, hundreds and thousands of Tibetan Buddhists will come to Morajambi to see uh, this, these sites where Atisha, you know, got it, had his master and where he learned and where there were these big monasteries and everything like this, you see.
these are some of the kind of minor remains if you see what I mean it's like dishes and pottery and so on like that some of it is very fine but of course a lot of it is broken do you know where Bidor is? this Avalokiteshwara was found in Bidor it's on display in the Museum Negra in uh, KL and it's 32 inches tall you know it's nearly three foot tall and it's a really huge statue and it's bronze and it's just found just south of Taiping yeah in Bidor you see yeah now, yeah, it's one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk because Bidor is only just south, SP is only just north, even Palembang is only just across the water. All these areas were major centers for Buddhism in the Middle Ages. You know, Bujang Valley starts around the first century AD. Yeah. and it goes up to about the 15th century we'll come on to it later it goes up to about the 15th century which is when Islam uh, came in and started getting a grip Islam of course started in the 7th century it didn't come in straight away and just conquer the whole you know the whole of Southeast Asia it's actually very late yeah. from the 7th century to the 15th century which is when Islam started taking a hold is actually eight centuries later during all of that time then these areas were these Hindu Buddhist kingdoms now why do we say Hindu Buddhist it seems to be the case that even sometimes they were Hindu kingdoms actually they were worshipping Shiva and Ganesh and uh, Vishnu and all the Hindu gods uh, many times though they, they were not uh, worshipping the Hindu gods they were worshipping uh, the Buddhist Bodhisattvas and the Buddhas and so on but still the polity and the social organization was Hindu yeah? that means the idea for instance of the king being like a god incarnate which was very prevalent uh, in Southeast Asia still if you look in Thailand he's like Vishnu incarnate the, you know the Chakri dynasty they're all called Rama isn't it Rama is an incarnation of Vishnu yeah they're all called Rama and it's understood in Thailand that uh, you know the king is like an is like an avatar or an incarnation of the gods like this and then he protects Thailand now that idea is not so prevalent now but it's known to Thais I can assure you but that used to be the situation throughout Southeast Asia in Cambodia it was the same thing they were like God kings but this idea has come from Hinduism and then the whole stratification of society was organized along Hindu lines the Buddhists don't seem to have um, really developed that side of things very much they just accepted the Hindu way of organizing things and the Buddhists kind of concentrated just on the religious side of things you understand and then the, you know the social organization and all that sort of thing they left to Hindu so you get this kind of Hindu Buddhist uh, kingdoms organized socially according to Hinduism uh, but many times religious focus was Buddhism and you know it's Mayana Buddhism and it's Vajrayana Buddhism not Theravada that's why that's why we call them Hindu Buddhist kingdoms another way of going through the Straits as I showed you before is to go through the Sunda Straits here uh, so you can come down to avoid the Malaccan Straits yeah which is where all the pirates are and where all, all these kingdoms are that are taking your money as tribute you know to let you through and everything another way was to come through uh, the Sunda Straits and then you could get down into Java and you can also of course go up you know into Borneo and you can go up into Vietnam, Cambodia and again into China which are the important trade routes when the Sri Vijaya Empire 
was waning. And one thing we have to say about these empires were they were very, very unstable. You know, uh, they would be flourishing in one century and they would be collapsing in the next century. You know, somebody else would gain power. Uh, somebody else would gain a, a bigger fleet of ships and then they would become the most important thing. So that happened also for Sri Vijaya, which, but eventually the Silendras uh, became the most important uh, kingdom and they were controlling the seas, also controlling up here as well where Sri Vijaya was. They had the power to be able to extract uh, tribute from these kingdoms along here as well. Of course you've got Malacca here and then you've got Kedar here. All of these areas are very important. Even up in, as far as into you know, what is now Thailand, like Chaya. In Chaya you get Sri Vijaya uh, remains. If you go up to Surat Thani, uh, which is around here somewhere, uh, then you'll find Sri Vijayan remains right the way into Thailand, you see, it's like uh, five or seven hundred kilometers inside Thailand. Now the Silendras are very important because of Borobudur. Borobudur, as you may or may not know, is the largest Buddhist monument in the world. It was built in the, you know, the eighth and the ninth century that means from something like 760 to 820. All that time ago, 1200 years ago, and it's still the largest Buddhist monument in the world. And it's also one of the most impressive as well. This is where it is. If you see jo um, Jakarta is here, and then Surakarta is here, and this is Yod Jakarta, like this. And Borobudur is slightly inland from that area. Now, when I was in Taiping in 2008, for those of you who go back far enough, you'll remember I was very ill. And um, I, I, actually, to be honest, I wasn't sure how long I was going to uh, be around. I didn't expect to be around in 2018, really. It's the case. I was quite ill at the time. And then uh, it came up to a situation where I had to do my visa run. That means I had to go out of Malaysia uh, to be able to get a new visa to come in to uh, Malaysia again. And then I thought, where should I go if I got one chance to go somewhere, you know, and to see something, where should I go? So I decided to go to Borobudur. I've got to be outside, Indonesia is alongside Malaysia, it's not so very far away and everything like that. And so I, that's what I did, I went with uh, my friend Leslie, who was living in Taiping at that time, an Australian, and we went to uh, Borobudur, and you know, it's like a stepped pyramid or something like this. And uh, when I first got there, I couldn't get beyond the first floor. For the first four days that I was visiting Borobudur, I could only get up the first flight of steps. I couldn't get up the next four step flights of steps. But I, I tell you honestly, I was so inspired by what I saw at Borobudur that eventually on the fourth day, I climbed to the top. <laughs> These stupas are about 10 feet or 12 feet high. These are on the top level. So these are some of the reliefs, just some of the nice photos. I'm not going to go into the stories, but you can see how, well anyway to me, how expressive the uh, carving is. This is done about 1200 years ago and uh, just some wonderful carving. I just happened to catch this with the right light uh, one time when I was photographing. It was actually one of the uh, earliest photographs I took, probably from 2008 or something. <coughs> also you see the musicians playing on a kind of lute and here they're playing on a flute and here they've got like a tambourine or something like that, you see. But the whole of, uh, you know, Javanese life 
is illustrated on these reliefs. There's uh, nearly 1,500 of them. It's sublime, you see. If you look at that face, to me, anyway, it just looks, you know, the expression and everything is, you know, just fantastic. The skill of the, the carvers, and it wasn't just one, of course, you know, it's like a whole group of carvers, but they all seem to have had this fantastic skill, you know, this amazing skill, and they could produce uh, these wonderful carvings. So this is uh, one that I use for the uh, poster, you know, and it's a ship, of course, and then, you know, you've got these outriggers, you, you understand an outrigger where it will stabilize the ship so when it's in the ocean it doesn't topple over if you get into a storm so it has these outriggers and everything and they uh, sailed these ships you know not only throughout Southeast Asia up into China over to India and everywhere but even to Madagascar Madagascar is just off the shore of Africa you know the, the Madagascan language is actually an Indonesian language. And what, what has happened is they've sailed this, these boats like this over the Indian Ocean all the way over to Madagascar, thousands of miles. Working from these illustrations, they actually reconstructed a ship out of wood uh, at Borobudur, they actually reconstruct. I mean, you can find the ship now in Borobudur. It's not on the coast, so you can't sail it. And they actually sailed it across recently, I mean, I mean, in the 1990s or something like that, working from the illustrations that are found at Borobudur. This is not the only one, this is one of them. So they built the ship, they actually sailed it across the uh, Indian Ocean all the way to Madagascar. It must be a, at least a couple of thousand co uh, kilometers or maybe 3,000 kilometers or something like that on the high sea, you know, really a difficult journey, but they did it. Yeah? And not only did they do it, but they did it in the 8th, 9th centuries as well. Okay, Borobudur is not the only it's not the only monument that's found ar around the same area, which is where the Silendra uh, dynasty was found. You can see this is on three floors, yeah? I mean, it's got a, you know, it's raised first of all, and then this is the first floor, this is the second floor, this is the third floor, yeah? This is Chandi Sari, uh, which is on the Prambanan plain, just north of Yogyakarta, not far from Borobudur. So if, if, if you go to Indonesia, there are a lot of monuments, really a lot of monuments there to be seen from, this, uh, from these kingdoms, you see. This is another one. In actual fact, this photograph is taken not long after, do you remember around 2011, there was uh, an earthquake that hit Indonesia. In fact, it happened so often, you might not even remember. All of these were buildings, and then they just collapsed. This is actually uh, Chandi Sewu. Chandi Sewu is the second largest Buddhist monument in Java, not in Indonesia, but in Java. It's quite elaborate, you know. They, they were actually, I don't know, maybe maybe 50 or 60 buildings around a central uh, temple. This is a central temple it still managed to stand. Now as you, as you see, for some reason, but we don't exactly know why, the center of power kept moving east. So first of all, you can say the center of power was in Kedar, and then it was in, it was in Sri Vijaya, yeah? And then it was down in Java, but central Java, that means around this area. And then it moved farther east again. So there's a couple of kingdoms. Kedari is an important kingdom in East Java, 
one of the uh, earliest kingdoms in that area and uh, it was during the Kedari period that Sri Vijaya collapsed completely and after that we no longer hear about these kingdom about this kingdom it's uh, finished at that time this is now around the 11th 12th centuries for Kedari that was succeeded by Singasari uh, that comes like almost immediately afterwards so it's 13 uh, 12th 13th century there's many of these kingdoms I can't go into them all but the the last and the most important and the biggest empire that was founded in Southeast Asia was Majapahit you know their empire actually stretched from Thailand, Malaysia, Sumatra, Java and out into the east which is where the Spice Islands are so by that time the spices had become a major source of revenue for uh, these kingdoms all of these sort of areas out here is where you find it's what they call the Spice Islands actually so some of these spices you know were, were, were worth more by weight they were worth more than gold and these spices would be taken but not only to India but these spices also went to Arabia where they were very important the uh, Muslims also treasured these spices and they also went into the Roman Empire into Europe and everything where they were also uh, very treasured so you can see if you're taking uh, spices out from eastern Indonesia all the way over to India around India and then up around to the Arabian coast through the uh, you know the, the, the straits that go into Europe and everything by the time you've got them to Europe you know they cost an absolute fortune and what the Romans would give is silver the Romans had silver in abundance and they would pay for these spices with silver and then the silver would flow back into into Southeast Asia so Majapahit this is you know it's more or less just uh, south of Surabaya Surabaya is the second largest city in uh, Java so I, I was there, I went to East Java last year fantastic to see you know uh, even myself before I went I, I kind of had some expectations but really it's much better than I un understood they actually have hundreds of monuments in Eastern Java okay this is in East Java unfortunately I looked and looked and looked to try to get a good photograph that gives you an impression of what this um, monument is like but it, I don't have a good photograph which shows the whole monument uh, unfortunately uh, but this is Chandi uh, Penataran and this is looking across the lawns and it's the second largest Chandi in Java it's really a, not the second largest Buddhist Chandi but the second largest Chandi in all so this is a Hindu Chandi in uh, East Java and it's really a wonderful place I don't know if you can see but a, a, along the wall at the bottom of the thing there there's all uh, carvings and everything just like at Borobudur uh, but not only there in other places as well this is Chandi Brahu you see the design is different yeah the design is very aerial it go goes up this is East Javanese uh, style you, you saw in Malaysia and in um, also in Sri Vijaya it's different it's very square but in the East Javan side you've got these monuments that kind of kind of zoom up into the air really quite impressive another one this is a gateway originally along here and along here there would have been walls there was a large wall about 20 foot high around Majapahit it's now uh, what we you know the, the modern village is called Troalon 
Uh, so you can go to Troalong, many, many monuments there. It's like a whole area of monuments, actually. So this was a gateway. Originally, there would have been a wall this side, a wall that side, and you want to come in, you have to come through here, and then there would be people taking taxis and, you know, protecting the area. You can't just walk in now. Yeah. You have to get permission to come in. This is a, another, it's like a bit, what we say, a bathing gat. So it's built down into the ground and then, you know, you can see the water with a temple right in the middle of it, like this. So various ceremonies would have been done in this in the center which would only have been accessible to like the king and the brahmins or you know the high officials like this this is uh, covering over one uh, you know chandi area they're trying to protect it and that's inside you see so it's like this from the outside like this from the inside as you can see you know it's been excavated one of the things that happens surprisingly enough is that ancient uh, monuments not just in Asia but everywhere ancient monuments uh, the ground around the monuments rises uh, because of debris and it's kind of like a, like a natural phenomena if you go to uh, Rome or to Greece or something, you'll see the same phenomena that a lot of the uh, temples or ancient remains and you have to go down to get into them yeah. because of this phenomena of um, the ground around it rising so same here you see when they've, ex this was originally fields when they've excavated it they find it's actually you know all these buildings are underneath it and there's, you know, the whole of Troalon is covered with these sort of areas. This I like very much. This is also East Javanese style uh, relief work. Now the Borobudur sculptures are very classical, yeah, very fine and very realistic and very classical in their outlook. But as you can see in East Java, they're like these uh, puppets. So they're like the Wayan puppets. So when they did the carving, they did them like Wayan puppets, you see. It's actually somehow, I don't know, to me anyway, it's very pleasing, you know, because it's very individual and it has its own characteristics and everything. And then they're telling the stories. I, I, oh, this is uh, uh, Pati Yajna. Um, it, it means a sacrifice. Uh, this is a story of a sacrifice. You know, there's many old Javanese stories, they're called Kakawin and they're told in poetry uh, so most of the stories that you know from India like Mahabharata and Ramayana and Arjuna's story Arjuna comes in the Krishna story Kri Krishayana as well all of these stories were retold by the poets in Java and they were also repositioned from uh, India into Java so you can visit these places where Rama went and where the battle you know the, the, the battle that is the centerpiece of the Mahabharata you can go to where that took place but it's in Java not in India because they've transposed it uh, to there and they have these elaborate poems in old Javanese uh, they c c come down from maybe between the 8th and the uh, 14th, 15th centuries a whole uh, series of uh, poems retelling these Hindu stories this is just, you know, look how stylized it is and how beautiful it is it's an apsara, an apsara is like a divine maiden or something like that I just think it, it's only three and a half inches tall but it's solid gold and somehow that is so striking I think it, this was done in Majapahit and just you know I mean it's really fine work 
that they were able to do fine gold work, you see, fine carving uh, on the reliefs, you know, wonderful architecture and everything. Uh, you know, just it's really impressive the architecture and the artworks that come down from this period. This is interesting. This is the king and the queen, or it's two queens, I forget. It looks like two queens, actually. This is Gayatri, who is a very famous queen on the left. And I think this is also a queen. But anyway, these are the tombs of the kings and the queens. There's actually more of them around, but there's only the two in this, in this photograph. There's probably six or seven or eight around. Very humble, actually, if you think about it. This is where the kings and the queens were buried. And they've not made, you know, a terrifically elaborate thing. It's actually very humble. Uh, just a small thing, you know, that's about the length of a person, you know. It's not much bigger than that. Uh, it's just enough to bury somebody. Very humble funerary uh, remains. As you know, uh, eventually Islam came in. It's quite an interesting story how Islam came into Southeast Asia. But they credit the conversion of Majapahit to seven saints, seven Islamic saints. So their tombs are in, in East Java as well. And we went to them and photographed them. And as you can see, they're very similar to the Majapahit tombs, right? But this is uh, one of the imams, I suppose, who was uh, responsible. There's seven famous imams who were responsible for the missionary work in East Java that started spreading Islam and then after that you know it gained a, a real foothold in fact there was Islam was there earlier but it was just amongst the uh, Arab traders you know there were Arab traders living in Majapahit there were Chinese traders living in Majapahit the Chinese traders of course were Buddhist the uh, the uh, Arabic uh, traders were Muslim, so they were there, but it hadn't come to the general populace at that time. It was a foreign religion, but eventually, through the work of these missionaries, uh, then the whole country, uh, probably following the king, you see, if the king is Muslim, then to get ahead, you must be Muslim. Just like in British times, a lot of people converted to Christianity, because if you convert to Christianity, you can get a job in the civil service. Like that, well, it's true. Like this, and then people converted, and then they, they uh, you know, managed to improve their social status, go up in the world, and so on. Now then, this is basically the story I wanted to tell. But Majapahit fell to Islam, and the whole of East Java and then Central Java and everything fell to Islam in the late 15th, early 16th century. And it's actually only uh, 400 years that Islam has been, uh, you know, the prevalent religion out here. It, it's like it's always been there. You know what I mean? But it's not always been there. It's like a temporary phenomenon. It, isn't, it won't be there forever either, you know. But for this 400 years, then Islam has been the major religion in Malaysia and in Indonesia. When Majapahit collapsed, then the remains of the Majapahit polity moved to Bali. Yeah? And it's in Bali now that you can see the last of these Hindu Buddhist kingdoms. Yeah? If you go to Bali, they still maintain these traditions that come down from Majapahit. Even a lot of the texts and everything like that were preserved in Bali, in old Javanese uh, writing, but they're preserved in Bali, whereas they're lost completely in Java. So if you want to get, I don't know if people have much exposure uh, to the Balinese culture, but it's a wonderful culture. You know, it's a really beautiful culture and you know, wonderful artworks that they have and wonderful dances and you know they also do this puppetry 
and so many things and they have the temple culture and this is the last of these Hindu Buddhist kingdoms that is still thriving in its original form uh, in Southeast Asia is in Bali you see so if you want to get an idea of what these kingdoms were like in the Middle Ages in actual fact you can go to Bali and you can find out now in other places where they've uh, you've got some sort of remains like in Cambodia and in Thailand and uh, in Laos like that these also these kingdoms come down but they've modernized a lot and they don't maintain the traditions you know they went through different developments like after this period you know they, they moved the capital to Ayodhya and then from Ayodhya to Bangkok and so on and so forth went through many many developments in their politics in their culture and everything like this but when Majapahit went to Bali it is more or less the same culture today as it was in the 15th century when they uh, came out from uh, Java yeah so that's the uh, kind of story that I wanted to tell I think it's uh, very interesting it's not only a historic story you know one of the interesting things is uh, when the in Indonesian independence movement one of the main stimuluses for that movement uh, you know they, they were occupied by the Dutch one of the main stimuluses for the independence movement is when the story of Majapahit was rediscovered around the end of the 19th century and then there's a, there's a, a book one of these Kakawins that I was talking about it's called uh, Negara Kritagama and this tells the story of Majapahit in its glory and then the Javanese realized that in previous times they had had this wonderful kingdom that was you know it was stretched from Thailand out to the far uh, East Indies and everything like this you know and then they became inspired by that instead of just being subjects you know a subject race under the Dutch they rediscovered their roots and then they, you know because of that the leaders were very inspired and they gave rise to the independence uh, movement now when I was there it's really amazing you know they have Majapahit festivals every year all the Muslims go yeah the Muslims go to the Buddhist temples as well there's Buddhist temples in Troalon and so on the Muslims will go there and everything you know and uh, they, they, they hold uh, festivities and all this sort of thing and they take their children and they're trying nowadays to inspire people with the stories from Majapahit as a counter to Western culture because the Western culture is seen as very degenerate and they're trying to counter uh, the Western influence by going back to Majapahit even till today you see and they teach the kids about it and what a proud history they've got now in Sumatra it's the same but in Sumatra it's the story about Sri Vijaya yeah how great a glory the Sri Vijayan Empire was and the Sumatrans when they, their independence movement was taking place they were inspired by Sri Vijaya so it's not just a historic story that is over and past and has no kind of meaning now you know it's actually uh, had a tremendous influence uh, throughout the 20th century even into the 21st century where they're trying to resurrect these glorious cultures that they had in the middle ages as a counter to these kind of corrupt cultures that are coming in uh, from the west and so on okay okay everybody say sadhu